Good evening and welcome. I want to take you somewhere tonight, somewhere very special, to an island which lies just to the south of the Peloponnese in Greece. It's not a very big island, a couple of miles wide, most of it is barren rock. And for much of its existence, Hydra was on the margins of history. A few farmers, a tiny population. It was once owned by the Venetians, then by the Ottoman Empire. But the Hydrians learnt how to build boats. And in 1757, they launched an enormous 250 tonne boat, which overnight turned this sleepy fishing port into a vibrant and important commercial centre. And by the 19th century, Hydra was home to 125 boats and 10,000 sailors. Large, graceful mansions of the sea captains ringed the port, a testament to the prosperity of the island and a golden opportunity for the visitors who were yet to come. The fire ships of Hydra were critical in winning the Greek War of Independence because the Hydriots were brave as well as canny. But after that, well, things fell into decline. There was a famine on Hydra in the war, and 8% of the population starved. The once mighty sponge empire spluttered and eventually failed, as all the natural sponges were fished out in the Mediterranean waters. The 50s rolled on with little activity, apart from the sun baking down on the rocky island, as if waiting for its next act. Then, at the end of that decade, a few visitors found their way to the sun, the sea, the bars and the beauty. They were artists and poets, dreamers and chancers, escaping the depressing post-war culture of the West, looking for a paradise, looking for a place to dream a while. They might not have built any ships or dived for any sponges, but in their time on the island, they wrote books and poems and songs and they gave the world a window into what could be a paradise, a paradise both found and lost. In the evenings, as the sun sank slowly and spectacularly into the Aegean, they would gather at the port, at the bars that lined the quay. In particular, they gathered at Catsicus, where on this day in 1960, a young girl called Erica has just arrived. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Hydra. Welcome to Polly Sampson's A Theatre for Dreamers. Hi, Polly. So there you all are in the set for Katsika's Bar and Taverna, which is the set that we would have had had we been out on the road when your book came out. Yeah. And um, we were going to be in London, Manchester, Birmingham, probably Edinburgh. And of course, we were going to be tonight in Hay. So this set is fantastic. And I can see in the background, there's David and there's Hello, Romani David. and Charlie. <laughs> and Charlie, Romani. <laughs> and of course, that lovely introduction with your piece and Gavin Elder's beautiful footage of Idra, which was filmed, God, it's only two and a half months ago, it feels like years, but um, that was also meant to be the introduction to the show that we were all doing. So, I mean, it's lovely to have it to use here tonight, but it also is tinged with sadness. Thank you, Polly, so much for being here tonight for Virtual Hay. As you know, this is now nearly the end. So let's start right at the beginning. How did you find your way to Hebrew in the first place? Well, it was you. And um, it was in 2014. And um, I just finished writing The Kindness. And we met for a, a coffee. And I was asking you where we might go, where the sun would shine and we could swim and, and walk and it would be quite peaceful. And you said, Hydra, obviously Hydra, because that is where the water is clearest and it's beautiful. I came across Charmian Cliff's book, um, this book, Peel Me a Lotus, um, which was in the house that we were renting. And, um, and that, yeah, that set me on this sort of labyrinthine voyage of discovering who, first of all, she was, and then finding that she was part of an international community of artists and writers, and that Leonard Cohen was one of them, and I'm a huge Leonard Cohen fan, and that, in fact, there were over 1,500 photographs taken in the year 1960 of that community, and on and on and on with the research, as, you know, I had identified more and more of the people in the photographs. But it started with Charmian Clift, after you. 
Ah, of course, Peel Me a Lotus. Yes, we found a copy in the house that we stayed in when we first went to Hydra. And I agree with you, it's wonderful. I, I felt the Charmian as well, just like you did. What was it that drew you so strongly to her? She is a superb writer and it's a wonderful uh, memoir about a year in their lives on Idra, this, her family. She was married to um, the Australian writer George Johnston and they had two children when they arrived and a third was born on the island. And she just writes brilliantly about, I mean, about nature and about emotional things, about the difficulty of being a woman writer, astonishingly well about how hard that was at, at the time. And, um, and she also writes brilliantly about the sort of people who even then were going to Idra, you know, sort of people who were more, you know, sort of pretending to write or paint, but really just wanted to hang out on the, you know, in the beautiful, on the beautiful island and under the beautiful sun. Um, whereas they, she and George Johnston really did have to work. They couldn't siesta or muck about. They had to, they had to earn a living from the books that they wrote and they wrote like crazy. They published 14 books in the eight years that they were on Idra, which is extraordinary. So the novel combines both fictional people and real people. Yes, a lot of the people were real writers. Um, and some of them became famous and their stories became known. And, you know, some of them, we know about their individual stories, but nobody, I, I don't think anyone's ever put them all together. And so while we know about, for example, Leonard Cohen and Marianne, we don't really know mm -hmm. about Leonard Cohen and Charmian Clift, but maybe that's because he never wrote a song about Charmian Clift, but he did write a song about Marianne. And that has immortalized her, really. And I think we're going to hear that song now. David didn't okay. Roman. Great. Yeah, okay. Okay, no, that's great. Okay. Come over to the window, my little darling. I'd like to try to read your.
Just when I've climbed this old mountainside To wash my eyes in the rain So long, Mary Ann It's time that we began Well, uh, that was that was fantastic, and you're absolutely right about how a song immortalizes someone in a way that very little else can do. So, yeah. let's go back a bit into the story. I mean, how did George and Charmian actually get to Heathrow? As I understand it, they were living in London, they were working as journalists. Things were going okay, but they were a bit on the edge, and so they decided to set off for somewhere new. And so it was both an escape and a chance to do something different. Yes, well, George had rather unoriginally been... Ha he, he was running um, a, a press agency in in London. He was, a, a, I mean, head of a, an agency for stories to go to Australia from Europe. And he unoriginally had been having an affair with his secretary, which, you know, she had two small children. They lived in Bayswater. At the same time, they were collaborating on three books that were published by Faber and Faber. And so she was spending her days sort of looking after the children and then get going to the British Library and doing all the research so that George, who had this amazing capacity with words, I mean, he could write, I think, something like 8,000 words a day. And so she would gather the material, and then when he got back from his day on Fleet Street, he would sit and they would both bash away on their typewriters to get these, these novels, novels written. And then, so they were terribly unhappy, and then she heard a story about a different island, the island of Kalimnos, um, where there was a problem with the sponge fishermen because the sponges were all fished out. There was a, a, an, an illness in the sponges and also synthetic sponges were taking over the industry. And it was very interesting. And there was an Australian angle because the sponge fishermen, who are incredibly brave, I mean, they dived to, to enormous depths just holding a rock. And they were being, there was a, a sort of move to have them taken to Australia to become pearl fishermen. But, and so they Word. thought this was an amazing story and that they would definitely get a book out of it. So sort of in the sort of wake of their, the unhappiness of their marriage and with this great idea, they moved to the, the island of Kalimnos. And in fact, the story went away because the Australian government changed their minds, but they still wrote a very good book called The Sponge Divers. And she, for the first time, managed to write a book without George. And she wrote a memoir called Mermaid Singing, which is a really extraordinary book about that year that they spent on Kalimnos, which was even more sort of basic than Idra. I mean, nobody spoke English. There were no mod cons. And, you know, it was a rough island of, of, of unemployed sponge divers. And that book was very, very interesting because it was as if they'd moved into sort of medieval times. Charmian herself is such a very complicated character. She's living at this extraordinary moment in history when one foot is in the post-war 1950s, very subjected housewife, and another foot is very firmly in the future. I think you bring that character to life so well and that just that extraordinary moment when you're almost kind of ripped in two. I think that they, and in fact, I interviewed Thomas Keneally because I found out that he knew them when they went back to Sydney. And the thing I really needed to know was, did they love each other? Because the sort of myth is that they didn't. Um, because, you know, it ends very tragically. But he was absolutely of the opinion that they did, and that was certainly the impression from my research that I had, was that despite everything, they really did love each other. And um, he was 10 years older than Charmian. He had what we would now call PTSD. He'd seen terrible things um, during his time as a war reporter where he covered, six, he went to 63 countries and he covered some really horrible things, you know, famines and he saw terrible, terrible things. And, um, and he started drinking. And um, so he was a sort of 
he was an alcoholic. He had TB, but it was undiagnosed. He didn't know that he wasn't dying of lung cancer. He just knew that he was terribly ill. And then in 1959, he sought treatment and was diagnosed as having TB. And then the drugs that he took to arrest the TB made him impotent. So now, you know, Charmian found herself on a Greek island in her sort of early 30s, married to a man who was 10 years older who was completely impotent. And she was a sort of ravishing, energetic woman. And then every yeah. summer, there'd be this influx of amazing, virile young poets. And, you know, the inevitable must have happened. And in fact, we know that it did. And George was riven with, with, with anger and jealousy, as I suppose you, you could understand why he might be also. I mean, it's a terribly sort of sad story with no winners. So you've got your story, but how did you decide how you were going to tell this story? From whose point of view? Who was going to carry the narrative for you? Because mm. you don't you don't tell it through their eyes, you tell it through someone else's eyes, who I suspect has got a lot of you in it. Yes, I think she must have. I mean, I don't know. She, she, she was a real eureka moment. But she's called Erica. Um, <laughs> she just called her eureka because I couldn't work out. I started by wanting to tell it for, in first person Charmian. And then I found that an Australian writer had done that and done that rather well in a, a very different sort of book. But it meant that I just felt a little bit hamstrung. And I thought it prob there probably did wasn't. Did you ever actually try writing as Charmian? What yes. Was it like? Yes. You... No. It was. It, 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 I mean, I kind of. I, I. I. don't just. Didn't just write as charming. I. I. I sort of would. Because I always do this thing called method writing. So even though I wasn't writing first person charming, I was still going to Idra and absolutely inhabiting Charmian because I needed to understand mm -hmm. how it was to her. I mean, to a ridiculous extent. I mean, there'd be times when I'd be sitting on the port. And, you know, the ferry would come in and people would get off. And I'd find myself getting very ruffled and, and sort of upset about the number of people coming, as though I was Charmian and I'd been there. And my daughter used to say, stop it, stop doing a Charmian. Because, you know, of course, you know, why wouldn't people be coming? It's lovely. And um, so, yes, I did do quite a lot of writing as Charmian before. And then I discovered, or rather David found this other book. And just thought, ah, oh, and I was really dashed by that. And I put it down for a while, but I couldn't forget about it. And then we went back to Idra um, because I know what happened. It was that um, Marianne Elan had died. And I'd always had this thing about, I knew that because Leonard is in all the photographs, you know, Charmian's got her head on his shoulder as he's playing the guitar under the tree in Duskus Taberna. And, you know, she is very clearly a sort of intimate friend of Leonard's. And, um, and I um, couldn't really work out how to put Leonard in the book because he, you know, what a what an odd thing to do. I mean, I'm an en enormously sort of admiring of Leonard. I mean, I think he is one of our greatest writers of our age, and the idea of putting him in a book and putting words into his mouth was really kind of terrifying. So for a long time, I thought that I'd just have it, because he was writing his first novel that year, I thought he could just walk past occasionally whistling and I'd never have, you know, he'd never, he could wave or something. And then I went to Idra um, and he died while we were there. And that made it, a, that really did kind of free me because I didn't have that feeling of, oh, I might run into him and it would be so embarrassing. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so after, once, once that happened, I then realised that there had to be a different way of telling this story. And I didn't want to just tell Marianne's story because I felt like that had been done, you know, a number of times. And it felt a bit obvious. But I did want to tell the story of a woman in sort of Marianne's situation, but maybe a bit younger. And then I hit on Erica, who's 18, and you know, has grown up in London in a sort of very old fashioned family without any expectations of having anything of her own. I mean, you know, brought up to make a good match, really. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, and so I just sort of thought, God, what would happen if someone right on the brink of women having some form of equality, someone right on the brink of that second wave of feminism. What would happen if she just turned up there with these people who had such interesting thoughts and such interesting takes on things? Because the other thing about Charmian is she, you know, in her essays, she is this really, really forward thinking woman about women and what women should be expecting and, you know, a proto-feminist and so interesting about women. 
um, and particularly about creative women. So I really want, at that moment that I came up with Erica, I did have this sort of <laughs> feeling of, oh, that's it, that's how I want to tell it. And the other thing about Erica is I thought that she, because she was, you know, unformed at the moment that she went to Idra, I thought it would give me a chance of using her as a portal for the reader yes. so that it would feel like the reader were right, was right there among my people and that she wouldn't get in the way too much. You know, I sort of thought that she could represent all of the problems, but without sort of having too much in her backstory, because she's 18, to sort of really get in the way. And then I came up with the idea that Charmian in London, where they indeed had lived, had been her mother's friend. And after that, it was, it was just wonderful. It was, there was nothing standing in my way. The port of Idra sweeps into view suddenly, dramatically, like a curtain has been raised between mountains. The symmetry of stone walls and mansions imposes a perfect horseshoe around the water where tiers of white houses rise like the seats of an amphitheatre. It's a magic trick from Barren Rock, a theatre for dreamers. The stage is lit by sun and sea and I'm gritting, gripping the rail on deck and Jimmy's got me by the waist as though he thinks I might leap as the port and its toy town come at us out of the blue. I look from the mountains to the ziggurats of houses and back to the colourful boats in the harbour and for the first time since we left London I'm happy. I imagine myself unfolding against the island's backdrop of green smudged hills, finding my way among the terraces and clustered pine. There's salt spray on my face and my mum's words in my ears. If I had wings, I'd be soaring. Spice-coloured rocks, scrub, brash, acid yellow herb, pitched orange roofs and salt white houses that rise to the gods, all eyes to the port. People pour on deck for arrival, pointing out windmills and likely swimming spots, black cannons lined up along the fortress walls. Jimmy's been reading Henry Miller and whispers in my ear, here it is the wild and naked perfection. I shake myself free of Jimmy and hug myself at the prow as Idra draws closer. The fumes make you cough, but I've been up here since Bobby announced in front of everyone that he wished he'd simply sold Mum's car rather than saddling himself with me. I think my crime was losing sight of Mum's old suede bag with the traveller's checks inside. I found it soon enough and mended the strap and came up here with thoughts of giving up and going home. Jimmy made a lame attempt to follow me, but backed away when I said I was sick that he never bothered to stand up for me. I immediately regretted it, but was glad to escape Bobby spoiling everything, to be free of the scrutiny of the black-shawled women down below with their missing teeth and trussed-up chickens. But left alone, my thoughts swelled from my problems to Bobby, to an overwhelming homesickness for my mum, and I allowed myself a good Aegean-sized cry. Mum would have got to the root of what was bothering Bobby, and I ached for the steadying grip of her hand. I even allowed myself to think my brother deserved a good beating by our dad. The ferry lets out two long bellows on her horns. People and donkeys are gathering at the landing stage. In the orchestra pit, the painted kaikis have been set swaying by our arrival. In a burst of superstition and excitement, I push myself past the other passengers to be first to set foot on the island. I step from the gangplank, stand for a breath. The polished flagstones are pink marble. Men with wooden, wooden handcarts are unloading sacks. Livestock glitters, earthenware jars are passing from shoulder to shoulder. Crates of loquats and tangerines, people shouting. The port is festive with flags and bunting, blue and white like the sea and the sky. I scan the waiting people for a face that might be Charmian's. There are women with market baskets and priests in black robes and dark glasses, shops and cafes and bars, striped awnings, donkeys decorated with beads and strung with improbable loads, drums of kerosene rolled along the waterfront, the thump of barrels of wine being stacked. I leave Jimmy to straggle from the boat with our luggage and run off to find her. I really loved Erica. She's a brilliant creation and she carries the story really perfectly. I, I found myself that I related to her very strongly. I, it brought back all that memory of insecurities, of trying so hard to please, trying so hard to be brilliant, but also feeling really scared, you know, that you were going to be found out. Your women in the book are incredibly brilliantly drawn. I thought there was a terribly interesting contrast between Charmian, Charmian who's um, constricted but clever 
and slightly grumpy and wanting to push on. And then Marianne, who is completely acquiescent. And Marianne is always referred to as the muse. I mean, I think we've all heard that from everywhere. And of course, that gives her this kind of status that you know, people were an artist muse. But what did that actually mean in her case? I and mean, did she do something? Did she contribute towards the writing of Leonard Cohen? Well, I thought that, I mean, a lot of people that, that you know and I know knew Marianne and, and no one has a bad word to say about her, really. I mean, she's, she is a beloved person. And I think that, 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 you know, in the book, when Charmian sort of says that she rather envies her acquiescence to, to, to the male writer, um, I, th I think that, that I sort of feel that as well. I think it would be really peaceful to live a life where one didn't have one's own sort of drive to do anything but I did feel really frustrated about her as well because I think that she did allow yeah. them you know I mean I think it's perfectly reasonable to want to help someone else to do their work I don't think there's anything wrong with that I think you know when Marianne said living life is my art life is an art and she clearly was really really good at making a home and making everything wonderful and you know that that thing that, that is a sort of motif through the book that, that Leonard Cohen always said about how you know the, the sort of sweetness sweetness everywhere and on my desk every day a fresh gardenia and a little sandwich, <laughs> you know that is actually a really generous and lovely thing to do, but sort of in within the, the you know at the time it was sort of expected it wasn't a sort of generous act it was something that that you know it was almost like paying the rent you know this is what she did in order yeah. that these men would work and support her and there was some there's something about that that I didn't like as much and I didn't like the fact that it made such an unequal relationship that you know that they could go and and and, and stay out and stray and do all of these things and she had no sort of comeback and there, there there was no you know there what was source for the goose was not source for the gander you know there was only source for the gander and the poor little goose just stayed on her nest you know sort of fretting and so I think that um as a role model for Erica she was a very very poor role model um, and I think, yes. you know, and in a way, Charmian, too. I mean, Charmian, you know, who was just trying to do everything and was clearly exhausted, wasn't the greatest role model, but she was a, you know, it was a better way to forge a life, to look at Charmian and learn from it and um, than, than, than Eric, than, than to look at Marianne, who, you know, is a very poor role model because who actually does want to be a mummy to an overgrown man who, as soon as you have a baby you know, the man is so jealous that he has to sort of run away and find, find himself a new <laughs> mummy, which is my take on it. <laughs> well, let's, let's talk about the man now, because, yeah. I mean, Hedra was so blessed with all these different people, and the fact is it did have Leonard Cohen. It was the yes. island he picked. And people have very many different views about him. I, I feel your that with your research, which has been incredible and impeccable, um, you grow to like him. Yes, I started by not, I mean, I, I didn't, I always, always loved the music. I mean, and, and yeah. you know, the songs, you know, absolutely my favourite songwriter. But I never really kind of knew that much about the man. And I wasn't that interested in the man. I mean, I tried not to be because I always want to sort of separate those two things. I don't want to just, you know, admire a person because I like their work. Um, so that first time we went in 2014, I don't think I was even aware it was Leonard Cohen's Island. I mean, I don't know. what mm -hmm. Do you remember, guys? Um, I don't remember having any particular connection. I, th I did know, but yeah. I, that was about yeah. it. I mean, we, we never, didn't, didn't yeah. explore that at all. No, we didn't go and look for his house. And Idra is, you know, the Idriots are so cool that you wouldn't know it was Leonard Cohen's Island. You, yeah. you know, you kind of get it. They don't pay, they don't play, you know, Bird on a Wire in oh. every taverna. I mean, you just really wouldn't know, I don't think. Um, and so after, I, I don't think I even knew it was his island. Um, and then I kind of just, like lots of people, I think, assumed that, you know, this sort of ladies' man label and that he was a sort of rotter and, um, you, know, not, you know, not to be not to be trusted and broke women's hearts and wouldn't sort of, you know, commit to the mother of his children and all of these kind of cliches. But through my research, I found that actually he was very, very consistent and very true, and he never mm. made false promises, and I really do admire that. He knew himself really well. He was 25 when he went to Idra. He'd had one um, collection of poetry published, hadn't yet become a songwriter. He was working on his first novel, but even then, because the letters that he wrote to Marianne 
came up for sale at Christie's, and I, it was an amazing thing. I got to read them all. And he consistently, to Marianne, said he was really sorry that he couldn't be the man that she needed and that really she ought to find herself the sort of man who would fulfil her needs, that he couldn't be this sort of husband, father to her children, you know, that he really did need to, to, to blacken the pages in order not to go insane. And he witnessed right. his own mother. Get, you know, it ran in the family. There was this deep dark depression and the way you know at the at the end of his life he talked about it again that the way through that wasn't drinking women song spirituality you know drugs all the things that he tried to, to sort of medicate himself with none of that worked the only thing that worked was blackening the pages and that's what he was doing on idra i mean he was you know writing first of all his first novel and then his second novel and um, he never made false, as far as I can tell, he did not make false promises. And I think that's possibly, you know, absolutely the case, because where are all the women who hate him? You know, they, they, they don't well, exist. That's true. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. And Marianne certainly, if, if it is to be believed, I mean, went on loving him till the end. Yeah. Would you, would you say that Marianne and Leonard were collaborators? I think so. I think one could could easily say that the person who is making the circumstances for the other person to work is a it's an important part of collaboration. Um, I think that she was frustrated with with Axel um, Jensen, her husband, yeah, first, husband. first husband, who you know, <laughs> karma <laughs> karma is a strange thing because this was, he was a very serious and successful writer. You know, at the point that they were on Idra. He was 30 years old. He'd published an amazing memoir about his time living in the Sahara. He'd published his first novel called Lena, which actually has a, a, a sort of portrait of not very well disguised Marianne um, within it, which had become a huge hit, was translated all over the world, was made into a film. Um, he was really successful. You know, on the proceeds from his writing career, I mean, it seems amazing these days, he'd bought a BB sailing yacht, a Carmen Gear sort of, you know, convertible car, a house on Idra. I mean, this is a man of, of means and who, you know, and, and he was sort of dazzlingly handsome as well. And, um, but, but history now remembers him as the man who was the husband of Leonard Cohen's Marianne. And there's something yeah. karmic in that. Yeah. He treated her very badly, but within their relationship, he famously, you know, would give her his manuscripts and she would then write in the margin with a little cross. I think it was a little star when it was a bit she liked and a little cross if she was questioning something. And then he would get sort of semi-violent about any little cross because, of course, he couldn't take criticism but she was much more involved and I think she was quite frustrated by Leonard who wouldn't show her anything he was writing. Um, Charlie's going to read a Leonard Cohen poem. Um, I think this poem is particularly interesting because it was written in 1960. It was originally called Metamorphosis I believe and it is a, the poem that he wrote for Axel Jensen sort of at the point that Leonard took on Marianne and Axel's baby. One night I burned the house I loved, it lit a perfect ring, in which I saw some weeds and stone beyond, not anything. Certain creatures of the air, frightened by the night, they came to see the world again and perished in the light. Now I sail from sky to sky, and all the blackness sings, against the boat that I have made of mutilated wings. Oh, it's lovely. lovely. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. So did Marianne actually help write songs with Leonard, or was it about, as you, you talked about the fact he brought sandwiches onto the terrace, did she actually contribute any works, for instance? It's quite hard to know to what extent she helped, other than the, the famous gardenia and the sandwich, but there is that th Thing that is often quoted. Actually, by her, um, I think Joni Mitchell disputes it because Joni Mitchell claims that it comes from a painting that she did of two birds on a wire in their time together, which was simultaneous with the end of his time with... Anyway, it's very complicated with Leonard. But Marianne's story is that um, when the um, telephone wires were put into Idra, he came back, you know, because he would come and go. He didn't really live there. He came mm -hmm. for periods and, le and, 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 and he left again. And he, he, he arrived and he was sitting and he was in a terrible funk and he had 
sort of writer's block and he didn't know what to do. And he looked out of his window and there were these new wires and he got himself into a sort of real depression about it. And she walked in and there was a bird sitting on the wire and she said, come on, Leonard, if the bird can get used to the wire, so can you. And that apparently was the sort of starting place for Bird on a Wire, which I think... Um, we could hear. I think we could hear it, yeah. Oh, that would be brilliant. OK. Fantastic. Like a bird on the wire Like a drunk in a midnight choir I have tried in my way Some old fashioned book I have saved all my ribbons for thee. And if I, if I have been unkind, I hope. so much that was lovely and would you say that George and Charmian were collaborators did they work on each other's texts that's very interesting because they collaborated they 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 when they were a young new romance in in, in Melbourne um, they well, and then in Sydney they collaborated on a on a novel together George had already published sort of two or three novels based on his travels and he then wrote a novel with Charmian which won a major prize it was a, the Sydney Morning Herald novel prize I mean it was a it was a quite considerable sum of money I think it's what they used to go to England in fact and right. then they got the contract with Faber to do these three other books. And she was then stuck as his collaborator. And it was when they were on Kalimnos that she actually had to, and you can see this in the letters, she had to find a way to stop George interfering in her work because she wanted to write her way. And even when she was writing her memoir about the island and the, 
George wanted to sort of collaborate with her and she had to say no this is my book and I want to write it and it really shows I mean it's 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 you know you can see her just blossom when she's just there on her own writing and then but he never lost the need of her she very much didn't want him his help with her books but he, he very, very much wanted her help with his. And in fact, his enormously best-selling book, the book that, that, that got them back to Australia, which is this one, it's called My Brother Jack, and it's you know one of the great Australian novels. Well, he wrote that in their last year on Idra, and she had to sit on the step in the studio next to him for every word of this book, sort of prompting him and reminding him about Australia. So he really couldn't write without her, but she really wanted to write without him. Do you see any similarities in the way that you and David collaborate to the way any of your characters collaborate? Were you able to draw off your own experiences? That no, not really. No. Um, but you collaborate a lot, don't you? Yeah, we we, we collaborate on 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 songs, but it, we're very lucky because, you know, on the whole, we're not collaborating on lyrics. I mean, we have written lyrics together, and I have found that quite um, tricky. Um, I found collaborating on lyrics quite tricky. The, you know, actually, the thing I like to do is write the lyric to the music that David's already written. And I, I like a top line, and I like him to sort of scat a top line, and I like to write the words with, with the top line. And so it's a very different sort of collaboration. We're not, I, I don't think I could collaborate with anyone writing a novel. I don't know how she did it. I, I, it's just, yes. you just need to be on your own. You need to have a world that lives in your head. And the idea of being with someone else, dragging you out of that world, because they can't really share your trance. You know, you can't both be in the same strange, trancey thing that you need to be in um, to write a novel. What about with your son Charlie, who's got his own book coming out in August this year? No, God, no. no. I've only just read it. I mean, it's been... Um, <laughs> I mean, no, not at all. He's. I don't know how he ever found the time to write it because he's just had... Um, well, he hasn't just had. He's got a, a daughter who's now... 16 months old and somehow he he wrote a book as well um called featherhood um but no i don't think um i don't think charlie you wouldn't be able to work with a collaborator would you um i don't think anything is done in isolation but i wouldn't like someone peering over my shoulder. No, no i think it's that thing of someone but the idea you have to sort of I, th I find that I have to get into a, a situation where i imagine there will never be a reader otherwise i wouldn't write a word i think right yeah i Although think I, one yeah. of the many things that I love about your book is the feeling that it may sound ridiculous, but that you're the keeper of Charmin's secrets <laughs> and her life. And <laughs> it's very precious. And one of the many things that I really love about this book is this character, Charmian, and the feeling all the way through that book that you are rooting for her. Your research is, is amazing, Polly. It's very, very likely peppered throughout there's never a sense that you've read a magazine and dumped a paragraph in and I know you did a huge amount and I love the fact that you remember things like people were reading Doris Lessing and the magazines and um, Gregory Corso and all the different people that flipped through the book but the Johnsons themselves had a pretty sticky end yes um, they got back to Australia and George was terribly ill and their marriage their last I one of the people I know on Idra just said it so brilliantly when I was talking to her about and she'd known them um and she just said they stayed too long and you know what had been mm -hmm. this, this amazing thing that they'd done they'd fostered this whole community and had a really lovely life and their children were very happy there um, it just dissolved into alcoholism and violence and, you know, infidelity, and it became a mess. And apparently everyone was, re you know, really pleased to see the back of them because their fights were so public. So obviously during the summer in the sun, there is sex simmering under the surface among that community in Hydra. And there's a very powerful moment in your book when Erica jumps in the water and she realises that she has a sexual power over the grown-ups. Yes. Um, <laughs> It's um, it, it 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 is a sort of coming of age novel, and um, there are these moments where she sort of dips between, as we do at eighteen, between being a child and being a grown up. And you know, there are moments when she's sort of slightly disgusted that a twenty five year old with hairy arms might look at her in a sort of flirtatious way. But maybe I'll read that part because it is about her sudden realization that she has some sort of power. 
Um, That'd be great. Thank you. Sunshine stalks us. It binds us to the rocks, casts us in bronze. It sharpens shadows, blazes the mountains, strikes the white walls so they almost blind us. We slake our thirst with retsina and beer, live on fruit and salad and bread. The thought of cooked food makes everyone feverish. We take long siestas among the fir trees with our many new friends and bob around in the merciful blue sea, making plans for sundown and nightfall. We hop like fleas from bed to bed. Those with houses the least number of steps up from the port find their beds get hopped in the most. Even the most disciplined among us has given up pretending to work. The revolutionary poems stay half-written, paintbrushes stiffen in jars of congealing spirit, my notebook grows vague and filled with doodles. The moon rises like yeast from its bowl in the mountains, beneath us the rocks remain warm from the sun. The breeze is laced with pine and mountain herb and suggestion, and as I settle deeper into my crevice, the crushed leaves of rock rose are sticky with the smell of churches. These rocks and the sea belong to us once the tourists have finished with the sun and gone back to their yachts and hotels. We're all of us complicit in this freedom, and there's nothing to fear. Even wicked police chief Manolis seems to have been defeated by the sheer numbers. The music is almost deafening some nights from Lagudera where girls in bikinis dance outside in the street. Leonard sent off the manuscript of his novel on the same day that Marianne dispatched the baby to Norway. He says it's the only copy in the world that's now winging its way on a prayer to his publisher in Canada. It appears he can think about little else but burning boats and drowned mail. He scans the horizon from his favoured rock, threading his combali beads back and forth through his fingers with a look of such anguish, I can only suppose that it was the I Ching told him not to make a copy before sending it. It seems like Marianne has been hiding away since getting back here from Athens without her baby. Now she and Charmian climb out of the water and stand drying off, taking turns to rub a towel through their hair. They allowed me to walk right on the plane with him, Marianne saying as I stand at the edge and pull off my dress, look around and decide nobody will care if I step out of my pants. It was an empty flight, just Nita and Susie and three men in suits. I almost stayed. It would have been the easiest thing in the world to have just buckled myself in. I can feel Leonard watching me. I turn and catch him at it. He doesn't look away. I glance at Marianne. She's noticed him looking. Something starts hatching inside me. The sea slaps the warm rocks, but only gently. I plop myself in and flip onto my back and let the waves bob me while I wonder at this thing that seems to come fully fledged with the power to wreak havoc. I squint up at them, all ranged on the ledge with the moon and the mountains behind them. I swim back to the ladder. Little Booley crawls across the slippery, wet rocks. The sea water makes his underpants droop like a nappy. Charmian's swimsuit does her no favours and is so worn out it's becoming transparent. Marianne is a silver sylph in a new yellow bikini. She's asking Charmian about a recipe for curry and hurriedly hands me her damp towel so that I can cover up. I'll leave it there. So you did extraordinary research for this book, but one of the amazing things you stumbled across was this extraordinarily large cache of pictures that were taken at the time by the photographer James Burke. Yeah, that was an amazing moment. I mean, the research for this book has been so enjoyable because things just kept turning up. And there is nothing more helpful than 1,517 mm. photographs just suddenly landing in my inbox. And you can learn so much by looking at those photographs and seeing how everyone related to each other. You can tell there are things like there's that sort of famous incident at Duskus Taverna when Leonard Cohen played his own songs for the first time. And there was James Burke over from Athens. He'd been a, a wartime um, friend, correspondent friend of George Johnson's, and he was there to make this Life magazine um, photo reportage piece, which actually never appeared, of this um, bohemian community. And um, so I knew that one of those photographs, I mean, most of them weren't known, but one of them is very famous. And it's um, one of a series where Leonard is playing 
guitar and Charmian is next to him below the tree and you know in some of them her head is actually on his shoulder they're very touching and it really does beg the question what was the relationship between mm -hmm. um, Leonard and Charmian and there are other wonderful moments such as when you know there, there's a whole series in, in the contact sheets where Axel Jensen Marianne's husband picks up the guitar and everyone takes a loo break and he's sort of playing but she rather she rather loyally stays on and I imagine that he's probably singing in Norwegian I, I don't know um, but I knew I wanted to get at the end of the novel back to that famous photograph of, of Leonard playing what is purported to be his first concert um, but I needed to know what he was playing although I wasn't going to be kind of stating it necessarily I kind of needed to know what it was so I went through lots of his songs trying to work out what was the first one he played and um, I came up in the end I came up with um, a song called Fingerprints which although it didn't here on an album until um, the late 70s I and mean, when it was on the very unpopular Phil Spector album which actually I love um, mm. it does appear um, in a collection that was published in the 60s called um, Parasites of Heaven in fact it's the collection that Charlie read from earlier um, right and so it just made perfect sense to me that he might have been playing that under the tree. It has all sorts of echoes with the life that he was then living. And it is the sort of song that everyone can sing along to. Um, in fact, I think we're about to all sing along to it. Um, and I think David is going to play it for us. Wonderful. Thank you. I touched you once too often Now I don't know who I am My fingerprints were missing When I wiped away the jam Yes, I called my fingerprints all night But they don't seem to care The last time that I saw them They were leafing through your hand Fingerprints 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 where are you now, fingerprints? Yeah, I thought I'd leave this morning, so I emptied out your drawer. A hundred thousand fingerprints, they floated to the floor. You know, you hardly stop to pick them up. You don't care what you lose. Ah, uh, you don't even seem to know whose fingerprints are whose. Fingerprints, 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 fingerprints. Where are you now, my fingerprints? And now you want to marry me, you want to take me down the aisle, you want to throw confetti, fingerprints, you know that's not my style. Oh, sure, I'd like to marry you. But I can't face the dawn With any girl who knew me When my fingerprints were on Fingerprints 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 Where are you now, my fingerprints? Try again Fingerprints 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 Where are you now, my fingerprints? much we're going to take a few questions from the audience now and we'll be going live to them in a second but thank you all really a lot for being with us and to everybody who's out there listening um please buy polly's book it's an absolute treat of a read um we may or may not get to greece this summer we are all hoping to but that book will sure as hell take you there so thank you for joining us oh thank you rosie and thank you hey what a lovely alternative this has been and thank you to my lovely von trapped family thank for you. helping us <laughs>